is China about to open the Chinese space station to commercial companies? It's well known that China's space program, and especially crewed spaceflight, is handled quasi-exclusively by state-owned companies. And this is in sharp contrast with what is going on across the Pacific, where NASA has been relying on commercial companies for an increasing number of programs, and so far definitely rather successfully. Now, China has slowly been shifting towards more commercial activity, and over the past year, this trend seems to be finally spreading to the realm of crewed spaceflight, and especially over the past 8 to 12 weeks. Now, as always, let's get into the nitty-gritty details of that statement. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. <laughs> The commercialization of space in China really started out only in late 2014, with new regulations allowing private capital to flow into the space sector. The Chinese central government initially had been acting very cautiously because space is considered as part of China's core strategic interests, and so the traditional viewpoint was that this was best regulated through state-owned enterprises, over which the government naturally has direct control. But as successes of commercialization on the other side of the Pacific seemed increasingly apparent, China has been exploring giving additional space to the commercial sector, releasing a slew of additional supporting policies like space-wide papers, commercial launch and satellite manufacturing regulations, and satellite internet policies, and so on and so forth. And ever since, commercial space companies have been sprouting up like crazy, many of which are still rather unknown to the non-Chinese public. For launch, for example, you have approximately 20 launch companies all aiming to build reusable medium lift liquid field rockets, hoping to become China's future SpaceX. You also have many satellite manufacturers as well as companies planning to deploy Earth observation, IoT, and SatNav constellations. But crude spaceflight and space exploration were notoriously absent because, well, you know, this represents the core of China's space program, it is very capex intensive, and more generally, your main customer for this subvertical is the government or a space agency, which in the case of China was handing all the work to CAST, the Chinese Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, China's largest space conglomerate, or more generally to some other state-owned institute or academy. But in the past 12 to 15 months, we've been witnessing a considerable shift. One of the very first hints was in January 2021, when the CMSA, the Chinese Crewed Space Agency, published a request for proposal for a small cargo spacecraft to complement the current much larger and existing Tianzhou spacecraft built by CASC, which is very capable, it puts 6.5 tons into LEO, but it's unable to return cargo to the Earth, and it lacks the flexibility of smaller complementary cargo spacecraft. And while it remains a little bit blurry if this RFP was really open to commercial companies, the way it was openly published and the phrasing putting emphasis on low-cost cargo development did suggest that this was the case. And unsurprisingly, in the vicinity of these announcements, we saw commercial companies like Interspace Explorer, also known as Xingji Kaifa, emerge, and these guys were designing a cargo spacecraft matching those exact specs. And over the course of 2021, this trend only grew stronger. We saw notably an increasing number of commercial companies slowly edging into crude spaceflight territory. First, there were the many suborbital space tourism projects unveiled in 2021. You had notably CAS Space and iSpace going down a more Blue Origin New Shepard route, while there was another company called Space Transportation going for a two-stage wing spacecraft kind of design, which would also serve as a base to develop Earth-to-Earth, point-to-point transportation. And while suborbital space tourism is not really crude spaceflight, it can be considered as a stepping stone. And indeed, some of these companies mentioned earlier, like iSpace and Space Pioneer, have unveiled medium-term plans to build orbital crude spacecraft. There were also some commercial space biology experiment projects that were unveiled in 2021, notably from the startup Rocket Pi that was founded in December 2020. And these guys are developing the Sparkle One microgravity platform, as well as planning a space biology lab by 2025. And this is naturally very relevant to the CSS because microgravity and biology experiments in space represent one of the pillars of experiments on the CSS and the ISS. 
Now, at the time, these projects could seem very risky considering that there wasn't any clear central government support for this kind of commercial space exploration slash crewed space flighty kind of thing. But this seems to have changed considerably over the past four to six weeks. On January the 28th, 2022, China released its space white paper, which is a document roughly released every five years, and that describes the country's future strategy, mindset, and guiding principles in space. And in this paper was an unprecedented section called Encouraging Commercialization, which stated nobly that China will expand the scope of government procurement of space products and services, grant relevant enterprises access and sharing rights to major scientific research facilities and equipment, and support these enterprises in joining the R&D of major engineering projects. This paragraph in itself is absolutely huge. And there was also another section of this paper that referred nominatively to two Chinese commercial companies, iSpace and Galactic Energy, something that was also unseen in past versions of this document. And then just a few weeks ago, over the first weeks of March, came the cherry on the cake during the so-called two sessions. The two sessions, also known as Liang Hui, is a very high profile annual political event in China where leadership from Chinese industry, military, academia and diplomatic circles come together to discuss topics of concern and ideas for the future. And this was where we saw direct political support for future commercial activity of the Chinese space station and crewed space flight. Zhou Jianping, the chief engineer of China's crewed space program, nobly voiced support for private companies to join the Chinese space station, declaring that, quote, when the space station is completed and running, we will actively encourage the private sector to engage in China's crewed space program in various ways. There are many possibilities. We hope that there will be competitive, cost-efficient commercial space players to participate in areas including space applications and space resources development. And this was then followed by Yang Li Wei, the first taikonaut to reach space, and who's today the vice chief engineer of the crude program. He said that he believed it was possible for ordinary Chinese people to visit the Chinese space station in the next five years in a strong push for the development of commercial space tourism. And this is probably where the Wentian module that's scheduled for launch later this year will come in handy because it brings three additional sleeping areas to the Chinese space station. And we did an entire separate episode on Wentian, so do check that out if that's something that you're interested in. So in conclusion, if this trend continues, 2021 and 2022 may be seen in the future as the dawn of the commercialization of the Chinese space station. We're still very far from the level of commercialization that NASA has introduced, you know, where cargo, where crewed spacecraft, and potentially in the future entire space stations could be managed by the private sector. But for a country like China that was so centered in the past around its state-owned conglomerates in the space industry, what's happening now is a very big shift. Now, a question could be, where is all of this leading? In the short to medium term, I think it's hard to say beyond the announcements that I mentioned earlier, but it's likely that the trend of more commercialization will continue. In the very long term, China had previously expressed an interest in making lunar activities commercial. And in 2019, Bao Weimin, the director of the Science and Technology Commission of CASC, said the country was considering the idea of establishing an Earth-Moon space economic corridor by 2050, and he also praised the potential commercial output of lunar resources. But there are also others in China that think that self-sustaining commercial lunar activity is still pretty far off. And one of the leading figures of lunar exploration and ISRU, in situ resources utilization, in China, Guo Lin Li, was asked this year if this was achievable in a foreseeable future. And she answered something like, Asking to make lunar exploration economically viable today is like asking Isaac Newton back in the day to make money out of his laws of motion. The benefits are potentially huge, but they come much later. Please ask me this question in 200 years. I'm Jean Deville of the Dongfang Hour. Thank you very much for watching and a big thank you. Thank you to our most recent patrons, Larry Press and Hua Tuo, who went to support us at buymeacoffee.com slash Hour. And as always, a special shout out to Space Washout Global and Go Taikonauts, two excellent sources of space industry news. And I'll see you in the next episode.